Hi, I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Ann Charles. I'm Keith Ghostland, and welcome to All Things LGBTQ. We are taping on Tuesday, August 20th, but I will tell you it feels more like September 20th. <laughs> All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. And with that, oh, I get to go, hello. Well, first of all, we have an injunction that blocks the new Biden administration education department policies. Expanding LGBTQ protections in school will remain in place in Louisiana. And other states have challenged the rules after the U.S. Supreme Court kept a lower court order in place. The Department of Education rules issued in April clarified that Title IX forbids discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Opponents of the new federal Title IX rules believe they could uh, supplant state news like transgender bathroom, bathroom bans and other policies increasingly being enacted in Republican-led states like Louisiana, where Republican Governor Jeff Laundrie signed a bathroom ban into law this summer. They also believe the rules would transform traditional Title IX protections for women to compete in sports. So, We're going to keep going back and forth on that one, and I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get a good outcome. Yeah, no. I mean, every time it goes to the Supreme Court, of course. Exactly. But there's hope on the horizon. <laughs> November 5th, I've got my... Um, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. A crowd of, of, of hundreds called for abortion in LGBTQ reached Sunday evening in downtown Chicago, getting a head start on a week of protests before the Democratic National Convention kicked off Monday, starting with a rally on Michigan Avenue and Wacker Drive by the Chicago River with Trump Tower as the backdrop as the blazing sun set behind the Marina City Towers. Demonstrators headed south to Grand Park, to Grant Park, monument of Union Army General John Logan, which protesters climbed in the iconic, in the iconic um, movement during the DNC protest in August 1968. 68, did you say? Yes. yes. After an acoustic sing-along, by the crowd, my body, my body, my choice, my choice, punctuated by a flute and ukulele, <laughs> MC and activist Scott Bratt took the mic to say, Palestinian liberation is reproductive justice, a nod to the common thread that ran through speeches and chants during the evening. And we reject any political compromises on bodily anonymy, autonomy, autonomy added Brat, a spokesperson for Jewish Voice, Voices for Peace and a member of the social justice group Avada. Today we are coming together on the eve of the Democratic National Com Convention to, sh to be sure that they don't even begin without knowing our demands. And here's a picture of the demonstrators. May I add something? Yeah. Um, I hate to mention the convention if you haven't watched it, but it is available on YouTube. And uh, really, mo last night was really moving because three women who had been forced, who'd been denied abortions and oh. risked their lives, and one of them was from Louisiana, unnecessarily risked their lives. The third person was able to get an abortion. But she was from Kentucky, but she told it really moving story. And, and, and she was 12 and her father, her father, her stepfather. Her. Yeah. Okay. New financial disclosures show log cabin Republicans, a group representing LGBTQ plus conservatives paid Melana, Melania mm -hmm. Trump <laughs> nearly a quarter of a million dollars to speak at one of their events in I Florida. I wonder what she said. <laughs> yeah. Hi. <laughs> I know, I wonder if that's on YouTube. Yeah. 
the latest financial disclosure filed with the Federal Election Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Cough drop. By Donald Trump's presidential campaign, itemize, itemizes sources of income from both the candidate and his spouse. The papers show the bulk of income for Melania Trump came from licensing fees. But it also shows she collected money from one high-profile speaking engagement this year. And that was the Palm Springs Beach chapter for the log cabin Republicans. Mm -hmm. They paid 237000 for a speech in God. April. So That's really obscene. Or no, isn't it? I mean, what could she say? I don't know. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg will receive one of the highest honors in LGBTQ plus political ad advocacy next week. On Tuesday during the National Democratic Convention in Chicago, Buttigieg will be <coughs> inducted into the LGBTQ plus political Hall of Fame. Good. <laughs> <clears throat> and the Victory Institute's victory at the DNC event. He is expected to speak in his personal capacity. The recognition celebrates Buttigieg's trailblazing public service career, which has broken barriers and paved the way for greater LGBTQ visibility in American politics. I saw a report praising him for going on the... Um, Fox. Channel of the enemy, and yeah, he so, goes on there all the time and just gives so, him a hard time. He is so smart, and you know, doesn't pull any punches. And I guess they like you having him on. I don't know. A former go-go dancer, fitness trainer, and adult entertainer actor received a sentence of 15 years to life in prison for paid, for fatally stabbing his boyfriend in 2017. The San Francisco District Attorney's Office reported. Othman Almut Albegi, 33, pleaded guilty to second-degree murder for killing Keith Harris, 48, <coughs> that took place at, in their Hayes Street apartment on November 2017. He uh, had earlier pleaded not guilty to the crime, but as a part of a plea agreement, he agreed to waive the seven years he served already behind bars while awaiting trial. You can stay in jail for seven years awaiting trial? Absolutely. What if you're not guilty? Well, that's it. Oh then you sue, you sue for compensation. What happened to, like, quick and speedy? Yeah. It's negotiated on both sides. There has to be a reason for it, and traditionally there are... Seven years? It's wow. based. It's based on the severity of the crime. All right. Well, I'll read this story, and then we'll move on to Anne. The Steamboat Springs, Colorado, LGBTQ community won't let threats of violence stop them from living with pride. Drag artists in the Colorado city are hosting their biggest show yet after a local man allegedly threatened to carry out a mass shooting during one of their performances at local nightclub Shumagadee's. Sh live music, and dance bar. John Clark, 28, was arrested on July 17th after an employee at the nearby establishment of Sun Pies Bistro called 911 to report that a male was threatening to shoot up the bar due to the drag queen show that was going on, according to an arrest affidavit obtained by a local outlet. So there you go. Good for them to keep going. Exactly. Mm -hmm. All right, and distance. Well, I have some unpleasant news to begin my. Um, I'd like to begin with the program note. Lesbian Claudia Lopez <laughs> lost to her mayoral race in Bogota in a series of electoral defeats of left wing office holders. Oh, oh. She's been replaced by moderate Carlos Fernando Galan, who has, was sworn in on January 1st, 2024. She is currently an advanced leadership fellow at Harvard, so she landed on her feet. <laughs> yeah. And I think she'll go places, even though she had that 
on such a loss. Um, I have one uh, item of world news. Uh, you've probably heard it on mainstream media. WHO, the World Health Organization, has declared an MPOX outbreak as a global health emergency. Mm -hmm. uh, they met on Wednesday. They, they <coughs> declared the ongoing outbreak in Africa a global health emergency. They convened its, uh, who convened, convened its emergency sure. committee because the deadlier strain of the virus had reached four previously unaffected countries in Africa. This strain had previously been contained to the Congo. Uh, independent experts met on Wednesday and told the uh, director general um, that he should declare the emergency. This is the highest level of alarm under international law. The detection and rapid spread of a new strain of MPOX in Eastern Democratic Republic, its detection in neighboring countries that had not previously reported MPOX and the potential for further spread within Africa and beyond is very worrying, the Director General said. The emergency committee met and advised me that the situation is a public health emergency of international concern. Um, this, this is a status given by H. WHO to extraordinary events um, that pose public health risk to other countries through the international spread of disease. These outbreaks may require a coordinated international response, according to WHO. The Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention declared the outbreak of public health emergency of continental security on Tuesday, the first such declaration by the agency since its inception in 2017. Um, since the beginning of the year, more than 17,000 MPOX cases and more than 500 deaths have been reported in 13 countries in Africa, which classifies the outbreak as a very high-risk event. <clears throat> the highest number, more than 1,400, is in the Congo, which reported 96 percent of confirmed cases this month. For decades, the disease had large, been largely found in Central West Africa, but it also began spreading to Europe and North America in 2022. WHO previously declared the spread of MPOX a global health emergency in July 2022 and ended that declaration in May 2023. WHO officials said last week the virus could be contained uh, quite straightforwardly if we do the right things at the right time. It's clear that a coordinated international response is essential to stop these outbreaks and, stay, and save lives. Do uh, they not give shots in Africa? They're not uh, that available. That's the um, thing. They need to make them available. But then, in an uh, unfortunate coda, the day afterwards, Sweden confirm, confirmed its first case of the viral strain of MPOX, uh, which also was the first case outside of Africa, a day after WHO declared the disease a public health emergency for the second time in two years. So that's very scary. If I may interject, because I had actually picked that up as a men's health issue. Oh. And, and, and it was the Sweden angle that it had, it had gone out of the Republic of the Congo. What people here should know is there is a vaccine available. It's a two-dose. The vaccine that we started giving for the first strain has found to be effective against this second strain. The Centers for Disease Control in America is going to do what they did during the last round of MPOX, which is reach out to the impacted communities and say, what is the education we should be providing you? What is the message so that it's appropriate? And it's one that people can use. And I didn't know this, people the, died either. Well, it's with the new strain. With the old strain, it was a very low fatality. That's one of why the World Health Organization has such concern is they're getting a higher percentage of fatalities. And the Centers for Disease Control, in their generosity, and you can do whatever comment you want, <laughs> they're sending 65,000 doses to the Republic of wow. the Congo. How generous of them. Bingo. And the other thing is, yeah, I read the part about the US and omitted it, so I'm really glad oh, you included good. it. 
Um, and what struck me was there was all this, the first headlines were about Sweden. Right. And then the back story is about the Congo. Pulled and in. I thought, this is imperialist reporting. Absolutely. You know, it's more important that one case developed. You know, that gets all the headlines when this has been going on in the Congo. And, you know, but thank you, Keith. Right. Um, now, Linda's covering my other international story, which I'm delighted to pass on to her. We're just stepping over each other. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> We're tag teaming tonight. Yeah, I know. It's all, it's all good. It's all collaborative. Um, I do have very, this is one of my favorite stories that I'm anxious to get to right away. It's now I'm in Europe, and I'd like to report on gay flamingos who hash a chick. <laughs> yeah. Let me show you a picture now of Curtis and Arthur <laughs> in a delightful display of love and dedication. Curtis and Arthur, a gay pair of Chilean flamingos at the Painton Zoo in Devon, England, Devon, England, and I'm covering this, I'm counting this as England, although it okay. could be Chile. Um, they've successfully hashed, hatched a chick. This remarkable event <laughs> marks the first successful hatching of Chilean flamingo chicks in the zoo since 2018. Pete Smallbones, the <laughs> zoo's bird curator, shares the excitement saying, regarding the same-sex parenting, we aren't completely sure how this has come about. <laughs> Although it is no, a known phenomenon in Chilean fl flamingos, as well as other bird flocks. The most likely scenario is that the egg was abandoned by another couple, so this pair have adopted it. <laughs> Curtis and Arthur. This is sort of, I find this very interesting. <laughs> Curtis and Arthur are part of an initiative called Love Lagoon, inspired by the reality TV series Love Island, which aims to better document and engage the public with social media updates of the flamingo couples. Earlier this year, Paint and Zoo launched a special Valentine's Day campaign encouraging the public to name their fling flamingos. The Name a Flamingo initiative was hit with names being suggested, uh, was a hit, <laughs> with names being suggested and voted on through the zoo's, the zoo's Instagram channel. Among the other flamingo couples who have successfully hashed, hatched chicks are Florence and Flame, <laughs> Frenchie and Dell, and Flossie and Lando. Paint and Zoo's breeding program really shows the bird team's dedication to fighting these issues uh, and making sure the species survives. Fl Chilean flamingos, native to South America, face several threats in the wild, including egg harvesting, tourism disturbance, and habitat degradation due to industrial mining. <laughs> it's a testament to the skill and hard work put in by the bird team, and we are hopeful that we may see more eggs hatch over the coming days and weeks, small bones added. <laughs> Call it ironic that a group of flamingos is called flamboyants, <laughs> but this isn't the first time same-sex bird pairs have become parents. In 2022, two gay flamingo dads adopted a chick that was previously abandoned by his bi biological parents in Whipsnade Zoo in England. A pair of childless gay flamingos, Freddie Mercury and Lance Bass, also made headlines in 2022 after breaking up following their three-year relationship, a sad component. Oh. Same-sex behavior isn't unique to flamingos. We've discovered this many bird species, including penguins <coughs> like Sven and Magic. Remember yes. them? and swans like Billy and Elliot, and there's gonna be more about them if there's time, also display homosexual behavior. These observations highlight the diversity of animal behaviors and challenge the notion that heterosexuality is the only natural sexual orientation in the animal kingdom. Good. So let's hear for Curtis and Arthur. I'm, I'm gonna to have to walk around my building and see if I have flamingos missing. <laughs> Could be. They'd have to go over the sea. But, yes. you know. All right, I guess I should continue with um, less pleasant news from Europe. Um, in activists sound the alarm as gay exorcism cult seeks foothold in Scotland. There's this terrible religion, uh, Forward in Faith Church International, that um, has just been granted... Um, Non approval, approval from the um, from the uh, charitable organization board in Scotland. 
Um, it was founded in Zimbabwe in 1960 by Ezekiel Guti, who claimed God came to him in a cave where he instructed him to learn and read enough so that he could minister throughout the world. Alejandro Sanchez, human rights leader at the National Social um, Society, no, sorry, National Secular Society, called out the Charity Commission for its position because they approved it. Uh, it is now time legislators urgently review the advancement of religion as, as its charitable purpose. It must not, must not be used as a backdoor for charities to com promote com conversion therapy and the subjugation of women. According to its web website, this church has organizations located in over 160 countries and states. Now, I have another story. I'm counting Russia as part of Europe. Uh, this is ultimately a good story, but really intense. I'd like to show you a picture now of Sasha Sochelenko and Sofia Sabatina. They are kissing on a lawn in Germany, in Goblenz, to be exact. Um, they're planning to get married, and this wasn't an option in their native Russia, uh, but it's possible now that they live in Germany, which recognizes same-sex weddings. Uh, we don't know how or in which city we'll do it, but that's the plan, Sochelenko 33 told the Associated Press, looking lovingly at Sabatina, who radiated happiness, but there's a lot of backstory here. They reunited earlier this month in Germany shortly after Sochelenko <coughs> and other Russian prisoners were exchanged in a historic east-west swap, a happy if unlikely ending to an over two-year ordeal. Sochelenko, an artist and musician, was jailed for speaking out against Russia's war in Ukraine. Sabatina campaigned for her partner's release while also trying to make her life behind bars as tolerable as possible. Um, she visited um, her partner, um, so Sochelenko is silly, has celiac disease, oh. so she has, you know, and mm -hmm. of course the Russian authorities didn't accommodate her, so her partner visited her. She's an artist and um, she's a nurse and a pharmacist, um, but she visited her regularly and then um, she was, Sochelenko, let's go back even further, was arrested in St. Petersburg in 2022, just weeks after the invasion of Ukraine, for replacing price tags in a supermarket with anti-war messages <laughs> saying that Russia bombed civilian targets, for example. She was charged with making false statements about the military, part of the massive crackdown on all dissent after the invasion. She struggled in um, pre-trial detention suffering from um, the celiac disease that required gluten-free yep. free meals. Um, last year, Sabatina, her girlfriend, was diagnosed with cancer. Um, the couple didn't see each other for a year since they weren't married. Investigators made, made Sabatina a witness in the case and refused to allow her visits or to receive phone calls. Um, it's not a small thing when a person you love can't visit you, Skocholenko said. Sabatina added it was very painful, noting that she knows many women who married imprisoned men, often with wedding, with a wedding held in pre-trial detention facilities or in penal colonies. Then they could have long visits and phone conversations and so forth. She, uh, Sabatina was eventually allowed short visits, um, and they were always very open about their relationship, besides the horror in Russia the crackdown against LGBTQ plus activities. Um, Sochelenko said it was clear in the early 2010s that the Kremlin was heading in a homophobic direction and some of the laws the authorities were adopting drove her to protest back then. In recent years, she said her openness was a form of activism. In November 2023, this is the low blow, uh, Sochelenko was convicted and sentenced to seven years in prison, an unusually harsh verdict. Sabatina visited her in July, and Sochelenko recalls bursting into tears for the first time in months. The same day, a prison official told her to urgently apply for a presidential pardon, which, you know, just 
asked her to explain about the celiac disease. Uh, so she did it and forgot about it. But then several days later, she was transferred to Moscow without explanation. In the same van was Andrei Pivolarov, who was an imprison imprisoned opposition mm -hmm. politician. So it's like, what are they doing together? She spent several days, long days, in Moscow's notorious Lafortovo prison, where she was cold and hungry, unable to eat much of the food she was given, of course. Her, uh, Sabatina heard of the transfer and rushed to Moscow with the care package on uh, August 1st. Sochalenko and 15 others were put on a bus, driven to an airport, flown to Ankara, Turkey, where they were exchanged for eight Russians in prison in the rest. From Ankara, the former prisoners were flown to Germany, where Chancellor Olaf, Sch Olaf Schultz um, greeted them on the tarback. The next day, Sochachenko was finally able to embrace Sabatina, who flew to Germany when she heard the news. Uh, the days since have been euphoric, Sochalenko said, filled with small pleasures like walking and um, buying groceries. Also spending time with the woman she loves. Um, They've settled in Koblenz, but want to visit other cities to decide where they live permanently. They're eager to learn German and begin new lives. Sabatina, a nurse and pharmacist whose cancer treatment was successful in Russia, thank heavens, against all odds, I would speculate, hopes to work in human rights and the human rights field and, and help the hundreds of political prisoners in her former country. Um, we're going to have to move on now. I thought you might want to, but I just covered it at length because it's so interesting. Yeah. Ultimately, with a good outcome. You'll All have right. to inform us when they get married. Yeah. There'll be more pictures. Okay, so the trivia. There was just a phenomenal event in Plainfield, the Queer Arts Festival. There were over 80 participants, artists, artisans, <coughs> vendors, performers. It was overwhelming. But we really shouldn't be surprised because Vermont is no longer that sort of backwater environment Oopsie. that people envision. We have people who are renowned, both locally, nationally, and internationally, such as recently there may have been a Vermonter featured in a worldwide publication. So who might that have been? And what might the publication have been? Stay tuned. Rainbow Umbrella, you have a book discussion group? Yep. Same book? After Dolores by Sarah Schulman. Very good. Women's discussion group? And you're yeah, still I'm... meeting in person? Yes. Very good. Fox Market, Queer Poetry Night, Friday, August 30th, 7 to 9 p.m. And this is poet Liv, and I'm, I apologize now because I know I'm not pronouncing the name correctly, Maumanani. And their poetry focuses on queer identity, disability, ah. as well as beauty, love, and magic. So that should be interesting. Queer Reads, their final installment at the Fletcher Free Library, Saturday, August 31st, starting at 11. Light from Uncommon Stars, and we thank them for doing it. Fox Meadow, which we had interviewed in the past and we're trying to reschedule. They are doing, and they're in southern Vermont, their tagline is Oasis for Men, and they try to do retreats and events that are sort of out of the ordinary. And they have a whole series of events coming up, so please check their website looking at a 40-mile tri-state bike ride. Nude? A September 13th to 16th. No, that's the world naked bike ride, and it already happened here in Montpelier. Because I was standing on the street corner as they <laughs> went by, and I had totally forgotten about it. Uh, September 13th to the 19th is a de-stressing with touch with Colby Smith and people within the men's community, this is a renowned yoga instructor who does phenomenal work and apparently has been coming for over 10 years. They're also doing a similar workshop 
October 6th to the 10th, it's focusing on intimacy. So, and those fill up really fast. If you're interested, go on their website, sign up now. And then starting September 17th, which I think is kind of early, they will be engaging in those leaf peeping excursions. That's early. Uh, they want to see them before they turn. Pride <laughs> Center. September 4th is an interesting event, and it's specifically for people who identify as trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming. And it's with at Earth and Salt Toys, which is an adult toy store. This is a private sale, 15% off. <laughs> and they will have sessions going over how to use them. <laughs> uh, what, what is available, sort of what are you interested in, and you need to go onto the Pride Center site to sign up for it. But this is specifically reaching out to parts of our community that usually are excluded. So this is, this is a good thing. And then, of course, on Sunday, September 8th, is the Pride Festival in Burlington starting at noon. Who knows what they have for corporate sponsors this year? On Thursday, September 5th, 5.30, pop up at the Lincoln. <laughs> we haven't mentioned them in a while. Out in the 802, look on their website. If it's a Thursday night, there's a pop-up happening someplace. And what we haven't promoted before, Tuesdays, 9 to 11 a.m., DEV Vermont Viewpoint. The moderator is Isaac Evans Franz. And frequently, it is a queer-themed show, such as today's show is about the lesbian, uh, the lesbian, the LGBTQ plus caucus at the Democratic Convention. And next Tuesday will be a follow-up of, this is why we should pay attention to what just happened. I don't know why we didn't get invited to the convention. Or our friend Arshad Hassan is going. Is there. And Becca Ballin, our representative and friend. We should have gone. We could have asked questions, newsy questions. <laughs> we, we had the opportunity to ask to be a delegate. Ah, Maybe we should have gone. Years. Yeah, if we could hobble there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> on a sad note, Dylan Gurley, a 20-year-old transgender <laughs> woman, was stabbed and strangled to death on July 23rd in Denton, Texas. Mm. Her death and her Trans identity are just now being widely reported. She was identified by police on July 30th, and her killing is being investigated as a homicide, uh, according to the Denver Record Chronicle. She was found in, the, in her home in Denton and was pronounced dead at a local hospital shortly after. And then Ashley Bundage, Dej, 44, a DEI educator, former bank executive, a devoted parent to two teenage boys and a major booster for her homeland of Tampa, <coughs> could move one step closer on Tuesday to becoming the first elected transgender lawmaker Sorry. from Florida. That's when she competes in the Democratic primary to represent South Tampa, um, La, Grass, La Grassetta, the Equality Florida, she's the overwhelming favorite to win. Brundage is the final transgender candidate, the first transgender candidate <coughs> to be endorsed by pro-choice women advocacy group Roots List. So. Ruth's list. Ruth, Ruth, like Bader. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Did you not know there was a I, Ruth's no, I list? All right. So anyway, I'm very informed. All right. And this is a story that I stole from my aunt. Good. Happy to. J.K. Rollins off. and Elon Musk are both named in an Algerian Olympic boxer, Iman. How do you pronounce it? Kilifs. Cyberbullying complaint over harassment about her gender filed last week in France. And Donald Trump may figure in the investigation as well. The filing of a criminal complaint was already public knowledge 
as was the fact that Rollins and Musk, both noted transphobes, said she didn't belong in the women's boxing competition. They claimed she was transgender, which she is not. Nor is she intersex, although, of course, trans and intersex people deserve to participate in sports without discrimination also. The new reporting now links Rollins and Musk to her legal action. So that should be interesting. <coughs> and it's open. They can um, include other people, right. too. Good. Donald Trump used Shalon Dion's My Heart Will Go On at his rally. But the song was never authorized by her and is not good terms, and she is not in good terms with Donald Trump. Not to After her he credit. used her famous hit, My Heart Will Go On, during his campaign rally. On Friday, August 9th, the 78 year old former president played the 1997 hit song from the Titanic film as his anthem. But the 56 year old vocalist team revealed that his use of the song was unauthorized. Can she sue him? I don't know, probably, but. I, I think it's copyright issues. She and can it, make him stop. Well, it depends on who holds the copyright. And they can reach out and say, this is an unauthorized use, you must stop immediately. And then they could get a court action. Yeah. And this is a sad story about my hometown. Chelsea? Boston. Oh, well, yeah. I know. Boston Red Sox, and also my one of my favorite games, <coughs> suspended all-star outfielder Jaron Duran for two games without pay on Monday. The suspension comes after Duran was heard on Sunday's game broadcast telling a fan to shut your fucking, uh, oh, shut up, you fucking faggot, during his at-bat against the Houston Astros at home. After the game, the 27-year-old issued an apology through the, through the Red Sox, saying, during tonight's game, I used a truly horrific word when responding to a fan. <coughs> well, so he's out for two games? He's out for two games, and his money is going to Okay, so there was the fine attached as well. Yeah, no, well, he's not getting paid. So the money he would have been paid for the two games okay. is going to an LG... P flag? No, P flag, maybe, is going to a LGBTQ organization. Very good. So, and out, lesbian Senator Tammy Baldwin, Democrat from Wisconsin, who was the first out LG person, LGBT person elected to the U.S. Senate, is going to run against the Republican Senate, Senate nominee Eric Hovday, a banking executive, after the state's GOP primary this week with over 86% of the vote. Hovday. I think it's Hovde. Huh? I think it's Hovde. Really? Okay. Is running on a platform that's anti LGBTQ and anti abortion. He previously tried to run for Senate unsuccessfully in 2012 and since and since then has backed by candidates who oppose Baldwin including Leah Vukmir who ran against Baldwin in 2018. Vukmir supported a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex couples from marrying. And he's supposed to be a real piece of work. Oh, well, sounds person. like it. Yeah. yeah. Republicans have been falsely claiming that Minnesota Governor Tim Walz, Democrat, supports state-sanctioned kidnapping of kids from their homes if their parents don't provide them gender-affirming care. It's a lie, former President Donald Trump recently said at a rally. Do we have any children here? Please close your ears. He ordered tampons in the boys' bathroom, okay? He signed a law letting the state kidnap children to change their gender. These arguments are so lame. You I know. know, people believe it, I don't know. But on social media, they go unchallenged, they get repeated, yeah. so they get validity. It's unbelievable, really. And a former aide to Representative Tr Troy Niles, Republican 
Texas, is suing uh, the politician, saying he was forced out of his job because he was gay. Alex Chadwell worked for Niles from 21 to 23 <coughs> as a legislative correspondent and field representative. He said he was subject to homophobic comments and that once Niall learned that Caldwell Chadwell was gay, he got fired. So maybe there's another lawsuit coming. I hope it's successful. And for my last story is a woman who sued the Kansas Highway Patrol for firing after she came out as transgender was awarded $50,000 on Thursday. The deal was negotiated by the state's attorney general and, <clears throat> and was unanimously approved in a video conference meeting <clears throat> by Democratic Governor <clears throat> Laura Kelly and eight leaders of the Republican-controlled Kansas legislature. Mm. So. Okay, Ann. Okay, I have so many things I'm going to summarize. We're getting to the end of my Europe coverage with uh, unpleasant news from Bulgaria. Uh, there's been a rally outside the Bulgarian parliament because on Thursday, uh, the rally occurred on Thursday, denouncing <coughs> a controversial legal amendment that bans talk of LGBTQ plus and so-called non-traditional sexual choices in schools. So this is basically an anti-LGBTQ propaganda law that is, you know, building on Russia's trailblazing horrendous um, legislation. A similar anti-LGBTQ plus legislation has been passed in other countries in the region, including Hungary, Bosnia, Moldova, and Turkey. Uh, it's deeply troubling to see Bulgaria adopting tactics from Russia's anti-human rights playbook. Such actions are not only regressive, but also in direct <coughs> contradiction to the values of, of equality and non-discrimination that the European Union stands for. This is, these are the words of Forbidden Colors, uh, which is the LGBTQ. It's a uh, Belgium-based um, European rights group. Bulgaria is in the European Union and it's got the worst um, record. Yeah. Um, now let's have a little diversion in the form of a British film called Sebastian, which is hitting all the uh, airwaves. <coughs> it's a queer drama. In it, we follow Max, a 25-year-old freelance writer and aspiring novelist who seems well on his way to success in London's cultural spheres. Yet by night, he finds a different Ooh. kind of exhilaration as a sex worker with a pseudonym Sebastian, meeting men via an escorting platform. Wow. And more, um, I think it's a spoiler, I think she be, he becomes attached with one of, to one of his Ooh. jobs and complications Ooh. occur. So let's look at a clip. Tell me about yourself. What would you like to know? Well, I don't know, just the basics. Where you're from, what do you do in life? I have to say, I wasn't thrilled when you said you were writing about sex work. I'm sure you're aware there's no shortage on the topic, but I think it is alive, really intimate. It would be fantastic if we can get your debut novel published already next year. Have you thought about setting it in the first person? Hi. Come on in. You're new to this, aren't you? You've got that wholesome boy next door thing going on. <sighs> you know, there's not much money in writing fiction. But is it really just about the money for you? It's not that simple. Your face is going to be on the top of everyone's feed. I don't think I want to be that uh, public. I really don't think this could have been written by someone who hadn't lived it. Not everyone is deceptive. You didn't tell me it was a group thing. I don't do that. Why not? 
This is a novel. It is a different beast entirely. That is not what happened. It's just for myself. Out! Do you not hate me for using you like that? You need to carry on and finish it. All right, where's it playing? You are able to stream Sebastian by renting or purchasing on Apple TV, Google Play Movies, and Amazon Video. So it's an Amazon Prime. Okay. And now another happy story. Um, this is gonna have to be your last, so pick up. Oh no. Yes. Well, let me tell you it, if I may. <laughs> A gay swan couple built a nest together so the zoo gave them 3D printed eggs to raise. And let's look at a picture now of Billy and Elliot. A pair of male swans at an Australian <laughs> zoo were given the opportunity to express their fatherly instincts this year with a clutch of 3D printed eggs. <laughs> Early this month, zoo's, month, zoo's Victoria posted um, the story of Billy and Elliot Two male black swans at the Melbourne Zoo. <laughs> I suppose Cute. they pronounce it Melbourne. Uh, the pair were rescued after being attacked by dogs and have <gasps> remained at the zoo ever since. This spring, during mating season, they began courting each other. This is something we do see in male swans. Ben, a bird keeper at Zoo's Victoria, explained in the video, two boys can pair up. According to Ben, the pair even constructed a nest, all of which got the zoo's bird team thinking about ways to provide Billy and Elliot, presumably named, and this is so interesting, for uh, the title of a, of a character in the 2000 film. It was also a play yes. that Linda yeah. and I saw in London uh, about a young boy who dreams of becoming a ballet dancer and goes on to appear in Matthew Burns' queer take on Swan Lake with an opportunity to engage in reproductive behavior as well. So the zoo turned to Guy, a volunteer with the sanctuary, to who creates 3D printed eggs for all of the zoo's Victoria's properties. <laughs> eggs aren't necessarily about just making babies. They're actually a part of behaviors inbuilt in these birds, Guy explained. The team placed the fake eggs in Billy and Elliot's nest and while the pier showed a lot of interest in them, they declined to sit on the eggs. But then... They knew they were fake. I said, the Zoo's Victoria bird team intends to keep working on that. We're definitely going to offer eggs to them again next season. So, well, I was going to say, as you had already pointed out with the flamingos, abandoned eggs, abandoned chicks, you've got They, got, they know it's fake. They don't exactly. want to sit on a fake egg. Okay, I'll try to talk fast. Good. Let's see what we've got... Very quickly to tie up the Olympics, as Anne reported on the last show, at last count, 199 out athletes. Amazing. Oh, wow. 199. Well, it increased. The ratio, 9 to 1, they were women. <laughs> the final team medal count, 16 gold, 13 silver, 14 bronzes with 65 out athletes winning medals. Half the US women's basketball team are lesbians. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. OK, and moving from the Olympics into the next spectator sports, the Vermont primary. <laughs> All of the out LGBTQ incumbents made it through the primary. Becca, uh, Senator White, Representatives that we've uh, interviewed, uh, Brian Chena, Tiff Bumel, Marty Codis, Kathleen James, Sadia Lamott. Good. Emily Kornheiser. Emily had a close race, and they put up what people said was actually a Republican to try and unseat her. And in the primary, they went after Emily, saying she was to blame for your property tax increases mm. as chair of Ways and Means. Uh, Josie Levitt made it through. Heather Supernot. Moving from and moving from Vermont to the Democratic convention. Mm -hmm. Talking with the executive <laughs> director of the Vermont Democratic Party, five of Vermont's twenty-five delegates are out LGBTQ delegates, which means a quarter 
of our delegates. Maine, a third of their delegates are out LGBTQ. <laughs> Your hometown, Massachusetts, half of their electors <laughs> are out. Good. So, and the LGBTQ caucus was yesterday, and it is again on Wednesday. And it's happening in the <laughs> afternoon, and we can watch it on C-SPAN. They will live stream it. But looking at what the Democratic Party already has in place for their platform, and they put it out as the convention was opening, the LGBTQI plus section, they point out about Joe Biden signing the Respect for Marriage Act, um, undoing 45's ban on transgender military members. They're working to protect LGBTQ plus children, parents, and the adoption and foster care systems. He has, by executive order, helped protect gender-affirming care, implemented a strategy to end the HIV epidemic, opposes anti-LGBTQ plus book bans. Um, he has signed several executive actions to lessen LGBTQ plus discrimination in housing, employment, healthcare, education, judicial, with this comment being made, when a person can be married in the morning and thrown out of a restaurant for being gay, gay in the afternoon, something is wrong. <laughs> yeah. The platform pledges to pass the Equality Act, which we've come very close to in the past, to prohibit anti-gay discrimination among federal government contractors, a federal national ban on conversion therapy for queer youth, also pledges to end violence against transgender Americans, especially black and brown transgender women, as you've been reporting on, to pri prioritize <coughs> the investigation of hate crimes against trans and non-binary people. Its play <coughs> plank on education opposes the use of private school vouchers, tuition, tax credits, and opportunity scholarships. So, and we'll do more reporting after the convention next week. We can see what's unfolding. Very quickly, there was a case coming out of Minnesota that <coughs> was interesting, and it was a lesbian couple who was sued by the person who donated for their in vitro feature fertilization, ah. saying that he wanted to be recognized as a parent. Mm. He wanted to be recognized as the father. And their Parentage Act specifically prohibits this. And a lower court allowed it to go forward. Wow. The appeals court stopped it dead mm. and said, we have a statute that says this will not happen. Sent it back to the lower court to say, you will undo this and dismiss this case and uphold the statute. Good. So states like Vermont, with the Parentage Act, the court is going to recognize what is said within those statutes. And what was pointed out is you know, this person was known to the family, was involved with family life, they could have applied under the Parentage Act to be recognized as a second parent, but they chose not to do that, saying, I want to be, you know, uh -huh. yeah, there we go. Oh. So the answer to the trivia question <laughs> that <laughs> Vermonter who, and is she giggling? Who may have been on a worldwide publication might have been and Charles, oh. for an article about a lesbian art colony bloomed in St. Augustine. But this is not Professor Charles' first article. You could go online and read that one, but also find your muse here, buried in foreign soil. And that one was highlighted. <laughs> Annual queries. But were you gracious in your suffering? I'm, I'm not even going to ask about that. And there's three minutes left. All right. I talk fast so I could give our renowned critic and reviewer. International. 
are worldwide. Well, thank you, friends. <laughs> um, let's go to uh, New, South, <laughs> New South Wales um, yeah. with a picture of Peter DeWall because uh, New South, a suburb of Sydney, has opened a new LGBTQ center with a lot of features. And I'd like to show you a picture of Peter DeWall who opened, uh, started a phone service in 1973 with his partner. It was called Phone a Friend, and they did it in the front room of their house where they lived in another suburb of Cindy, uh, Sydney. It was a challenging time, but uh, he, he was escorted into this new center as the first guest. Uh, it was a great honor, and he said, you know, he can't believe um, that finally it's reopening. It had been closed for 17 years, and now it's here under this new incarnation offering many services. Um, I have a lot of stories from Asia, but I think maybe I'll save them. You have a time for one like little short one if you have okay, it. Okay, I have one sad one. Uh, a popular transgender TikTok influencer was found beaten to death on a Nigerian uh, highway. Her name is Abuja Area Mama. She's 33 and there's her picture. Wow. Yeah. And there was disturbing news about Sharia law in north of Nigeria and sort of vigilante groups yeah. attacking trans people. But Abuja is not in. Um, it's in central Nigeria. But anyway, so that's my one story. We'll save Asia for Susan to take over next time. You can mail it to her. I can. <laughs> Pictures and all. Okay, well, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in. And on that note, remember resist. to resist. And thank you, my friends.